Okay. All right. Uh, so the uh, next talk in the session will be uh, Peter uh, Skyva, who will be talking about uh, magnetic analog of black white hole horizon and superfluid helium three. Please, okay. please take it, away, Peter. Okay. So thank you very much for kind invitation. I'm pretty happy to give a talk. But first of all, I because this workshop is dedicated to <coughs> memory of Frino Panentani. I should say that unfortunately I did not have opportunity in my life uh, to meet him and to work with him. But <coughs> based on uh, your speeches, <coughs> he, he has he had to be a very great man and a very great scientist, I believe. And certainly, the work uh, he 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 has done will carry on somehow. Uh, so. I will talk about the magnetic analog of black and white horizon, but I still keep it a little bit in history because it is more than 15 years ago when we had a fantastic project, which was a COSLAB, Cosmology of in Laboratory. I think that uh, some of participants who are uh, listening to this talk that knew about this project and uh, this was a project which attracted me and I started to work um, in the physics and apply the physics of the superfluid helium-3 in cosmology. And it gave me a great pleasure to organize in 2005 COSLAB meeting in Smolenice. We have a picture here, which is uh, 15 years ago, and you may find there some faces, very well known faces, I believe. And one of them, uh, there is a little Silke, I believe she, she can find herself. But also as this um, workshop is dedicated to um, Reno Parentani, I think that we should also remember Tom Kibble, who is a was great man and great physicist. Uh, his work had a great impact. So. There is a talk out, my talk outline. I will give you a very short introduction to the uh, physics of the superfluid helium-3 phases as a model system. Then magnetic event horizon. I will say you details and uh, results as a measurement and some conclusion. Here are the people who were involved in, uh, in, this, in this work. So superfluid helium-3, I believe that many of you know to uh, fantastic books by Grisha Volovic, Exotic Properties of the Superfluid Helium-3 and Universe in the Helium Droplet. And there is an old story uh, uh, written about how the superfluid Helium-3 can be used as a model system. But what you see in this picture is a phase diagram of the superfluid Helium-3. We have a normal and A and B phase. There is an A phase. Inside there is also another phase, which is a polar phase. But the phase transition from the normal to the superfluid phase is the co most complex phase transition ever seen in nature, at least from our point of view as the humans, because it's associated with broken three symmetries, orbital, spin, and calibration symmetries. And it is in some sense analog with symmetry broken as universe phase transition. The violation of these three symmetries are related to how the Cooper pairs are formed. You have a <clears throat> helium-3 atoms has a nuclear spins. These nuclear spins, when you cool it down, they start to interact via dipole-dipole interaction. They start to precess. This is an illustrative picture. And they form uh, orbital momentum. So it means that you have Cooper pairs uh, created in the form of spin triplet orbital P wave state. So it means that uh, um, general uh, wave function or order parameters is much more complex than in traditional system and traditional like super uh, conductive system. So what is important is that you have uh, two spaces. You have uh, orbital spaces and the spin spaces. And these two spaces are coupled with the dipole-dipole interaction. And because it's a quantum system, this dipole-dipole interaction is somehow uh, magnified through the coherence. Uh, okay, so 
the main difference between these two A and B phases can be illustrated on this spectrum of the quasi-particle excitations, where you have an A phase having uh, two Fermi nodes and a B phase uh, which, which has a symmetric energy gap in the spectrum of excitation. As you know from the Grisha's book that A phase represents a model system uh, for the standard model, vacuum for the standard model, while the B phase, B phase represents uh, a vacuum for the Dirac model. And what is uh, beautiful for the future experiments that you may connect these two completely different vacuum states in one experimental cell, for example, using uh, magnetic field, and even you can uh, perform some experiment in, in including uh, just mentioned Casimir experiment uh, by Uf Lema. Okay, uh, the typical technique we use in um, uh, uh, probing with the superfluid helium-3, it's a nuclear-magnetic resonance. So nuclear-magnetic resonance equation uh, and the technique is a standard, but because the dipole-dipole interaction, you have an additional term. We have a um, dipole, uh, uh, dipole, um, dipole momentum, and it, uh, this superfluid, uh, uh, magnetic and spin superfluidity, uh, uh, forms and it causes that NMR is, is absolutely non-trivial. Because as a con con consequence, you have a spin part of the wave function and if you have gradient of the phase of the spin part, or magnetic part, in your order parameter, then you create the spin supercurrents. And spin supercurrents depends on the gradient and spatial gradient gradients in the in the face of the order parameters. Okay. And as a consequence, when you, when you do NMR, you perform NMR experiment, what do you have? Because typically you have a nonlinear magnetic field. So it means that you have, a, you create, when you create a pulse, you create, a, you have a gradient in the phase of the spin precession and the gradient in the phase of the spin precession creates the spin, spin supercurrents and this spin supercurrents transfer magnetization. So in principle, you do not know whether your relaxation signal or decay signal is caused by the spin supercurrents or by relaxation processes. And as a consequence of this and the consequence of the magnetic superfluidity, you may create a state with a coherent spin precession. And it is a, just the magnonic states uh, in superfluid helium-3. There is a few. The most, uh, first one uh, uh, discovered by Moscow Group in uh, 1984 is so-called homogeneously processing domain. And just I give you uh, explanation very shortly how it's, it is created. So imagine that you have a superfluid helium-3 B phase in magnetic field and the gradient. You apply the pulse, you deflect the spins, they start to precess. Because you have a gradient of the field, you have um, a dephasing, but this dephasing creates a spin supercurrents. And you have a two types of the spin supercurrents. Uh, there is a one is a spin up supercurrents, which uh, transfer magnetization to the high, uh, to the uh, to the part of the cell where there is a field is a bigger, higher, and spin down currents which transfer magnetization to the lower field. Because you have a because you have a wall, this spin supercurrents cannot pass farther, and it means that in a high field end of the cell, the spins are straightened up and orient parallel to the magnetic field, while in the lower uh, field part of the cell, the spins are deflected, and they are deflected until the dipole-dipole energy can be minimized. When it's, you created you create angle more than 104 degree, which comes from the minimum of the dipole, dipole energy, Dipole momentum start to increase the frequency of the spin precession and compensates and compensates inhomogeneity uh, caused by the field gradient. So you have a uh, volume of your superfluid helium-3 is split it into two parts. In one part, 
you have a spin deflected and process at the same frequency with the same phase, no matter that the field gradient, and in bottom part, you have spin along, um, oriented along the magnetic field, and this form non-processing domain, and there is a homogeneity processing domain, and between these two domains, there is a domain, domain wall. Okay. So, uh, as I said, um, the signal is uh, highly nonlinear. There is a disp uh, absorption signals from uh, HPD. You simply, you, if you use continuous NMR technique, you can simply decompensate some energy losses which are caused by quasi-particles excitation, which are still there. And uh, if you compensate it uh, by, uh, by um, uh, feeding the domain from the high frequency field, you can uh, control the position on a, of the domain wall as the position domain wall has to satisfy the Larmor resonance condition. So by just by sweeping the magnetic field, you can simply uh, decide how, how big volume of the homogeneity processing domain and non-processing domain can be, or even you can put your Larmor resonance condition away from the from the uh, from the cell, and you will still have this homogeneity processing domain uh, survive living. So it is uh, it is going to be a, a tool. It's a magnonic. It's going to be a tool, important tool uh, to investigate um, uh, horizon property. This state is a state of the dynamic equilibrium, and uh, if you if you apply tiny perturbation as any state, you may create an oscillations, okay? And uh, <clears throat> these oscillations are created if we apply, for example, some kind of additional longitudinal magnetic field alternating uh, the, the field, and you deflect it and you have uh, oscillations. As a feedback, there is a spin supercurrents, which return to the system to the field minimum. There is a whole bunch of the various uh, oscillation modes, and on this picture they are visualized. So there is a stationary HPD structure. Here you have a torsional modes, have a, some kind of the planar modes, and have a, some kind of the, the axial modes. And these are going to be, is, these modes are going to be a tool of, uh, which we are going to use to mimic property of the horizon. I would say that in language of the, uh, uh, of the fish, they are going to be our fish in in in, in, the, in the river, as you can as you could can see the later. We know uh, nearly everything about this uh, oscillation modes because we worked on it for um, fifteen years. We know that if we excite these modes and we keep uh, uh, HPD using high frequency field. This high frequency field violates uh, U1 symmetry and all these modes uh, gets an energy gap. So it becomes non on one because uh, uh, violation of the symmetry. So these uh, are picture from, you know, for the uh, torsional modes. And uh, this is a theory for the so-called so uh, axial, axial modes where oh, oh, again, you have uh, some kind of energy gap and dispersion relation for, for, for this particular mode. Okay, now uh, how we can uh, model the even horizon uh, of black or white hole in superfluidilium 3? I, I have seen yesterday and today that uh, uh, everyone listening to this uh, workshop, I think he knows about this paper by, by Ralph and Bill Unruh when they show that um, the water can be used um, uh, as a tool to investigate, um, investigate uh, analogs of horizons, or white hole, black hole horizon. And the German and others, and uh, Sil uh, Silke Weinfurten did a lot of experiments in, in, in the, with, this, with this system. Uh, the idea is very simple. We have been, because we know that uh, we have a spin supercurrent, so we form, uh, we create uh, two HPDs, and we will, we will keep them uh, uh, processing with, this, uh, with the same frequency, but when we change the phase of the spin precession, we get the spin supercurrents to flow through the channel, okay? 
Uh, and it is easy to manipulate because you simply change the phase of the high frequency field you excite HPD with. Then we know. There's uh, five more minutes, Peter. Oh, thank you. Just, that's very. Okay. Then um, uh, we know the dispersion relation for, the, for these uh, waves and we satisfy the condition that you need. Okay. So uh, here you have a theoretical model, there is more mass inside, you have this satisfies this uh, conditions, uh, boundary condition in order to get what is a, what is a, what is the parameter is a spin wave amplitude with this oscillation of the spin waves. And when you solve this, this equation, you will get dispersion relation with, in this form. Uh, what is a, what is the feature of this is uh, that if you have high non-zero high, uh, high frequency field, you have uh, some kind of uh, like the gap and uh, this relation, uh, dispersion relation is if uh, the high frequency field is zero. So uh, what is the crucial for this property? There are uh, two velocities. There is a spin flow velocity, which is proportional depends on the field gradient, and is a spin wave velocity, or so group velocity, which is proportional to the gradient of the magnetic field. And L here is the length of the HPD. J here is the gear magnetic ratio, and, the free, and, and omega RF is uh, is the frequency. Uh, effective metric looks like that, and of course, uh, horizon is formed where and when these velocities are equal. So the idea of the experiment is very simple. We manipulate the spin flow, excite some kind of uh, oscillation, and send uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, spin waves on the background of the spin flow, or in, which is going to flow in one or the second direction. And we have what we call the source domain, and have another domain which we call like detection domain. And here is an effective metric, and when we can control experimentally this gradient field and the length, and of course, omega RF. So here is a sketch of the experimental cell. I will skip it. Here is how this cell looks like in reality, It'll go faster. We know how to form and how to create two HPDs simultaneously. We know how to position uh, domain wall into into the channel so in, in order in order to manipulate uh, the height of the HPD we have a special resolution uh, 50 micrometers for particular and here is the result so what we did we did a pulse excitation we applied the eight pulses and uh, for the particular for the car, for the some kind of the spin flow value which is given by the phase difference between um, uh, excitation fields and what we analyzed here by method of FFT is just this frequency is this decay of the signal and results are here so here is a uh, phase difference as a uh, uh, and uh, here is a power spectral density is the amplitude so for the source do, for the source H HPD so what do we what we see here we interpret it for the negative for the negative values of the phase different the spin flow flows from the uh, source to the detection domain so when we excite the spin wave uh, spin flow uh, uh, drag spin waves and bring it to the detector domain which we can see how they arrive because here is a signal okay so when we decrease we decrease the phase difference we reduce the spin flow and in some uh, in, at, for some values, uh, lower uh, uh, than uh, higher than 10 degrees, we reverse the spin flow and then we excite the uh, uh, spin waves. Uh, uh, they, the spin waves are spreading against the spin flow, and at some point they are blocked and, and returned back because we did not see. We are not able. We did. We, we did not see any signal. Uh, coming to this uh, detection detection domain, so it means uh, uh, we interpret it as the fact that here uh, uh, in this channel uh, we form uh, a black uh, uh, sorry white hole horizon, and the waves are uh, spin waves are reflected reflected back. What you also uh, you can see here is that the signal amplitude um, in detection domain is is bigger than uh, when uh, when spin flow uh, flows from the source to the uh, to the detection detection domain what we also can do we can calculate the cross correlation and cross correlation looks like that so it means that in a, in a, 
at condition when uh, spin waves are blocked with uh, by spin flow, we have a signals are correlated, and here is uh, signal is un uncorrelated. And uh, uh, what's going to be here, I can uh, discuss uh, because I am uh, in the lack of the time. May perhaps uh, in, in in the question, if you wish. So, in order to uh, compare experimental results, uh, we did a calculation and uh, uh, we uh, estimated, based on the fact that uh, the, uh, all the gradient on the face is on a sharpest restriction, we calculated uh, uh, how should be the length of the HPD in the channel in order to get the condition for the horizon to be satisfied. And we found that uh, for this value, which are almost like the experimental values, uh, we got uh, the numbers of the 30 degrees, which in principle agrees with, uh, with uh, this, uh, this uh, experimentally observed values. Oh, okay, this is the last picture. We also did an uh, excitation using continuous wave for the two uh, phase differences, so minus 25 degrees and plus 25 degrees, and we see that there's no signal coming at all uh, when we um, send the spin waves again to the spin flow at, at this condition. Okay, this is work is, uh, we will can carry on, and I will leave you with uh, these conclusions, uh, and I'm looking forward to answer questions if you have some. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Uh, do we have uh, any, any questions from the audience? Uh, we have a question in the comments. Uh, so could, could you explain more on the U1, SU2, SU3 symmetry in helium-3? Okay. Uh, uh, sorry. It, as I said, it's, it's a very short time. Uh, no, it's not, it's not, uh, it was not about, uh, no, no, this is a, uh, these symmetries are for the universe. Uh, these are symmetry for the superfluid helium-3. So it's, it's considered like the analog. Because in, in here, in, uh, in helium-3, uh, normal phase has a no orbital momentum and spin is one half. And there is no calibration, there is no phase. So when uh, normal phase uh, and when helium C becomes superfluid, uh, you have an orbital momentum one, spin is equal one, and you have uh, the phase because it's of the parameter. And this is just only like a relation that we can some, in some sense look on uh, helium three as a system which has a properties of, of Phase transition has a property of the phase transition in the universe. Of course, there is a, uh, it's analog model, so or model, so we have to consider that it's model, not 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 real system. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, David, you you have a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, great talk. So I have a question on regarding the dispersion, the relation that you show. Okay. Uh, so I'm wondering if uh, you have measured any any effects considering the negative part because I I, I noticed that you didn't plot the negative part or, uh, yeah. or thank you very much thank you very much for this question uh, we know it and I have to say that uh, uh, it uh, this experiment was done many years ago but we had to work on it and to understand uh, uh, what, was, uh, what, 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 what is the physics behind, and we have to repeat it again. So because uh, what, you, uh, what we, sim I think what we demonstrated is just that this system is able to, uh, uh, to behave with the property of the wide hole horizon. But next step is going to, and we use the stimulated. The next step is perform experiment when we would like to see this, let's say the Hawking radiation and make these measurements more proper also in the sense of what you mentioned with negative frequencies and so on. Thank you. I think this. We don't hear your wheels, Justin. 
<laughs> Thanks. Sorry, uh, Jermaine. Uh, uh, we have. Um, uh, do you have a question? Uh, Silke, maybe first. She she raised her hand also. Silke, mm -hmm. you want to intervene? Uh, you were first. It's hard. To, I, I okay, was okay. trying again to okay. find. Uh, I'd like to know. I'd like to know if, uh, Peter, uh, your frequency is conserved during the blocking of the spin wave by the counterflow in the Whitehall case. Because there are many reasons why the frequency could not be conserved during the process. Do okay. you have uh, a uh, uh, the, thank, Okay. Do you, Carry on. Do, do, do you have a drifting of the frequency because of instability, or do you have a free harmonics generation, or do you okay. see I, linear I, linearity? Okay, thank you very much for your question. Uh, it's a very good point and what I should mention because uh, that this, uh, uh, these oscillation modes uh, we used, there are like oscillation modes in cavities. So we used only the measurements on the oscillation mode of the, the cavity and we focused on uh, just uh, this like the fundamental harmonic, I, 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 I would say, okay. But you are absolutely right. Uh, Next step, we, what we are going to do, we, 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 we will uh, study whole frequency spectrum we, 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 we may have. You are, you are okay. All right, uh, so okay, you have a, you have a question? And then Hi. if time permits, Yako has a question. Hi. Right. Uh, first, I want to congratulate you on this uh, uh, result because uh, it, uh, I remember the discussions back then when the picture was taken. It was quite a few years ago, and you worked on this for a long time. So I think it's quite exciting. So thank you. I have, I have a few questions. Um, uh, I'd like to compare it a little bit to BSC experiment, and for this, I need a few a few parameters. Uh, what's the temperature of your setup? Uh, okay, sorry, I did not tell you. Uh, was uh, this in this case was five hundred micro Kelvin. Five hundred micro Kelvin, very nice. Yes, wonderful. Uh, what's the speed of your perturbations? Oops, uh, 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 speed of the. Uh, let let me let me let me think. Uh, uh, just give you uh, gives you a number. Uh, uh, the spin wave uh, spin flow velocity. Uh, uh, spin wave velocity of order of 10 meters per second. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, 10 meters per second, right. Uh, now my last question. Uh, that's really fantastic because in order to find out how quantum these fluctuations are, you need to make sure that uh, you need the speed of sound. In, it's just to make sure that um, KBT is smaller than H bar omega. The larger the sound speed is, mm. Yes. So this is a fantastic system, but now comes the last check, the effective field theory, and the dispersive effects. So uh, could you also tell me what the size of the system are and in which K number the dispersive effects are coming in? Hmm. Okay, uh, I, I cannot ask for now directly. I have to, I cannot give you a number. I have to check it. I, I would answer like that. Because uh, the frequency, uh, okay, what we know, we know uh, the frequency of the measurements of this uh, spin precession waves. So it was order of 100 hertz. And uh, uh, the wave number, uh, I, I, I cannot tell you now, now. Okay, I just, did you really say 10 meters per second? Uh, you mean, uh, I, I tell you that the spin, of yeah, the spin wave velocity is order of uh, 10 uh, meter per second. And uh, of course, the uh, velocity of the spin flow, it, it's, it's here. It's here. It depends on the uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, gradient. But the excitation for which the analogy exists, that these excitations have a speed. It is here. It's, it's, it, uh, I can calculate uh, these numbers. It's, but numbers I cannot give you. It, it's here. In, in, in this, in this meters per second. Meters per second. Yeah, but it should be a meter per second. Yeah. That's all in the in the in the dispersion relation. All these questions. Uh, sorry, Jeff, I did not hear, hear you. Did, doesn't the dispersion relation show us the speed of the wave, the slope, and also gives the wavelength at, of the k's? Yes. The yeah. 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 Here. Yeah, but I mean, this, this system uh, is very quantum, these fluctuations. At that temperature, that's, I need to go through now, but this, is, this looks really promising. 
I think we should wrap up uh, the the discussion around here. Uh, just okay. Justin, just only uh, one comment. Uh, Okay, go I, ahead. I have to I have to leave above the five, so I have to leave in in half an hour because I have a, a family commitments. So, uh, but I, I I suggest if someone wants to discuss with me, we can do it on 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 a personal basis. No, no problem. I am welcome to uh, any discussion.